identify the charge of the muon, so in that way it will be will, will be able to identify the neutron event for the anti neutron event. And, uh, and the main part of this one is the resistive plate chamber, which I will discuss uh, later our work. So this is uh, really the, 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 the detector will have three modules actually next to each other, and each of them will have a size of 16 meter by 16 meter and 14 and a half meter in height, and uh, of weight 17 kiloton. So total will be 50 kiloton detector. And this iron plates will be 5.6 meter thick, and in between a four centimeter gap, but which will be filled up by this uh, this particle detector, the resistive plate chamber. So this is where is the detector dimension. So 150 layers, iron thickness, and then the the RPC units. These uh, will be each one will be something of two meter by two meter uh, in 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 uh, in dimension. And of course, the RPC gap is only two two millimeter. However, then your pickup strips, etc., will be something like 2.2 and half centimeter. So this will go and see that four centimeter gap uh, between the iron plates uh, for tracking. And uh, so this is something like so total number of resistive plate chamber that we need in this experiment is quite large, 30,000. This will be almost uh, uh, the five or I think eight times the number of RPCs being used by the CMS and Atlas detector together. So this is the largest RPC system that we use, and almost uh, four, 4 million channel of electronics to read out those uh, things. Is that RPC technology the same as used in CMS? No. Uh, so, so CMS and um, Atlas uses the backlight RPC, and uh, how we are planning to use the glass RPC. But yes, we will also be using the avalanche one. You can use it either in streamer mode and avalanche one, but we want to use it in avalanche mode because that is much more. To effect, et cetera, you know. So there are three modules, as I told you, next to each other, and then uh, you know, and then the electronics, etc. So this is underground lab. The closer look will be there. So now, what is it? Uh, the RPC, our detector says, so the features. The uh, so I'll come. To this this is the you can see the slot. That's what the coils will be running, and uh, the the magnet will be, uh, the iron plates will be magnetized. This thing. I'll come back later with the with the configuration of magnetic field we will get using this configuration. So magnetic field will be mostly inside the iron. Okay. So it will be tried to magnetic field in the iron. Yeah. So so sensitive so it is sensitive to muons. Uh, of course it will have the hydronic information also and it's a good energy good energy determination from the track length from the from track length as well as the track curvature in the magnetic field. So we'll have two measurement of the uh, measurement of the momentum of the muon. And the directionality from the tracking and nanosecond timing resolution, the RPC we are using basically because it has a fast timing. And we want to differentiate between the upward going neutron event from the from the from the downward going event because that's uh, that's that's very important because we have to do the L by E plot. And so that is why uh, these RPCs they are very fast, something like a nanosecond resolution can be obtained easily. And the charge identification from the track curvature in the magnetic field. And the hadron sour construction enables to determine the total neutron energy for the muons as well as the hadronic part of the sour. So this is the feature of this experiment. Now, what are the important questions that is remaining in the neutrino field, and why do you need this detector? Of course, you know, if you have seen in 2015 in the in the Nature issue, there was a the four detector that is upcoming talked about is the, is the, is Juno, ILO, and the Hyper K and the Dune which is going to address some of these issues that is listed here, which is the remaining question. The one of the remaining questions are, that is the, what is the dominant flavor content of mu 3 and uh, whether it is uh, nu tau or nu mu. So that is basically what you give the ball is the theta 2, 3, whether theta 2, 3 is 45 degree, or less than 45 degree, or more than 45 degree. At the moment, it is not very clear, but that's a very important question that we have to address. Second is neutrino mass order. We know that neutrinos are uh, three mass eigenstate, but uh, we know the mass quite different, but we don't know the absolute order. So that is also an important question, neutrino absolute mass of the neutrino, delta Cp, and Dirac or and beyond the standard, uh, or the neutrino standard model, whether you know, there are new interaction and so on. So these are the, some of the questions that uh, are addressed. Our detector are mostly you know, you know, designed to, to address the neutrino mass ordering problem that uh, we have to solve, and this is, uh, you know, in this picture it is shown that, you know, uh, you can, you know that we have the three mass against it, and uh, we know the the ordering of one and two, 
from the from the solar neutron events and from the MSW effect there. But however, we do not know whether the new tree uh, is is heavier or new tree is the you know lightest uh, of the tree. That's not uh, known yet, and this is the question. And usually, this is you know new one new two new three is uh, called the normal hierarchy. And this, uh, if it is so that the uh, new tree is the lightest, then it is called the inverted hierarchy. And uh, this is the one question that uh, will be addressed by the detector that we are we are designing. So, so I can physics goal is mostly of course the reconfirmation of atmospheric neutron oscillation using neutrinos and anti neutrinos separately, as I informed you earlier. Improve precision of the atmospheric neutrino oscillation parameter and mostly the neutrino mass hierarchy using the matter effect via the charge discrimination because the magnetic field will allow us to identify the neutrino event and anti neutrino event and the earth matter effect will either affect the neutrino or anti neutrino depending upon whether it is a normal hierarchy or an inverted, inverted hierarchy. So this is one question. The deviation of the theta 2 3 mixing angle from maximum value that is from 45 degree what I uh, determined in soft end and uh, some of the you know, exotic physics is oh. You mentioned the uh, uh, so, so, absolute measurement of the mass. Right. Not for, I mean, that's the remaining question in neutrino physics, but not for us. We can't, our detector. I think you mentioned that, that uh, you can measure the mass, and then in the next slide you said that yes, the neutrino mass is one of the equations if you measure absolute mass. So this is the remain important yes. remaining yes. question. Yeah, yeah. This is the important remaining questions in neutral physics. So that is you know completely different uh, ball game and uh, the trivia metric and so on. This way. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Not. I mean, these are the questions that I just put it together. You know. Okay. So now, so we have just uh, to before we have to you know design our detector. We have done a lot of exhaustive simulation. The complete GN4 based simulation has been done to find out the sensitivity of our detector, what sensitivity it has. So it is basically used the nuance and now also uh, using the Gini uh, software. Uh, this is the neutrino event generator, and then it goes through the whole detector geometry that I have mentioned, uh, the N4 simulation, event digitization, and the finally event reconstruction, uh, completely you know tracking and uh, and understanding the heat information to find out the hadron resolution and so on. And uh, this is our simulation framework that uh, we have used, and then we have started looking into the what is the reconstruction efficiencies of the muons uh, coming from the last event. Uh, the charge identification, you know, efficiency, the moment of resolution of the muon, and the resolution of the zenith angle uh, of our detector uh, for various angles and so on. So, and then using this information, then uh, or the resolution, we have done the okay. And in addition, looked into the the hadron heat information, just counting the total number of heat, and from there we have correlated that to the hadron energy resolution. And uh, this is the hadron resolu energy resolution that we can obtain. There are something like 85% at uh, 1 GeV level. And uh, using that information, we have gone ahead and did the detailed physics studies uh, of the capabilities of this detector. Uh, for example, how, how well we can determine the mass hierarchy, the octant and precision of delta square 3, 1, and theta 2, 3, then the synergy, and combine this also with the T2K and NOVA result that will be coming up. And as for finding various sensitivity, for the new physics, if it is violation, magnetic monopole such and so on. And these details have been, you know, and already been put up in the in the archive, and and, and the paper is coming out. Why do you need nanosecond resolution? Why do you need nanosecond resolution? That is to distinguish between upward going neutrino or downward going neutrino. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. 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 In principle, that. Timing resolution could be much better, but you don't need it. We don't need it. It's something like that. Oh, yeah. In yeah. fact, the art pieces can. No. There is no noise. Yeah. 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 The differences okay. are also big, so. Yes. So this is actually the the the, the, the if we, if we, so this is shown here. Uh, so this is the uh, for the normal hierarchy. And uh, for two, so we of course we, we do not know yet the value of sine square uh, two, uh, you know, sine square two three. So this is uh, so we have 
we have done an extensive, uh, I mean, basically the sensitive return based upon what is the value of sine squared two theta three, changing it from something like 0.4 to 0.6, and uh, it is actually having the point for the point four, and it will be point six, and this is for normal hierarchy, inverted hierarchy, and then uh, uh, then we have marginalized this prior prior, and then this is actually our this. This sensitivity is if we do not use the hadron information, and this this sensitivity this, this is using the so this is only the muon. You just take out the muon of the event, and then uh, from there you find your sensitivity. And this is add the hadron information, and then your sensitivity improve. So so this is this is what you will get something like you know we will get a three sigma signal or three sigma determination of the hierarchy over something like seven years of running. So, so what you know, can you explain the, the hadron? So if you look at only the muon, then you get a certain Yes. Then you add on the hadron. So you do not have too much resolution for the hadron. We only have the heat information. Because in the RPC, we are just using heat or no heat. Okay, yet not the total charge here. Okay? So they do not have very good resolution. So we just use the total, you count the total number of it and calibrate it is the is the, the energy of the pile and then use that uh, to find out, you know, add the uh, resolution. What exactly this five sigma is five sigma for what? Three sigma. Yeah, but what, what is three sigma? Three sigma. So delta, this is different. So delta chi square different. Delta chi square difference is the normal. If you have your data, you you just have the hypothesis. What is it? The normal hierarchy or inverted hierarchy? You get a chi square plot, right? So delta chi square is roughly the square root of delta chi square. So it's is, you compare two hypotheses. Exactly. 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 And see what is the delta chi square value, and then plot that one. So that's normally the, the, you know, all the experimental you know, proposing okay. so, so to get from so that depends on where you are, where you are. Yeah, something like seven years. So yeah. if you add hydronic, yeah. then yeah. you do it of much, course. much better. So if you if you now since Nova and you know T2K will improve their measurement, so we hope that using improving that, uh, so this is our our colleagues have done actually this is more sensitivity risk in three, six years combining this, uh, you know, you can know what simulation also. So this is the current situation for the normal hazard and then might invert in hazard. Roughly around six, seven years for three sigma. And what do they do So this is, yeah. So we have not you, but what can they do? Oh, so the NOVA and uh, this one? See, NOVA has sensitivity to the mass hierarchy because it has a, some matter, but not enough. And so the idea is that if they combine the NOVA and T2K, I mean, that's what the current, if you see the neutrino in you know, 2016, and this is what is uh, plotted actually, they have shown that sensitivity on the, on the mass hierarchy and, and let us see. So you're saying NOVA by itself doesn't have a lot of bang. Or it is it is difficult for no one. Yes, yes. Simply because it doesn't have enough matter. Because here you depend upon the matter effect. Okay. Okay. So this is octane sensitivity will not do too much. Oh, sorry. Can I ask? I'm sorry. So Nova is because the depth, the matter effect is not. Much. So matter effect is that uh, how much is the it's actually seven seven hundred thirty kilometers distance. And that's not enough. For, if you had for, a beam pointed from CERN, let's say, to uh, I know, you would have much more. Of course, of yeah. course we had. And that was our original plan when the theta 1, 3 value was not known. And people thought that theta 1, 3 value would be much lower. And then, then of course, you had no option but so called magic baseline, where, you know, uh, 7,000 kilometers is one way to look into even smaller angle. Okay, theta 1, 3. But now, that we know that theta one three almost eight degree, which is quite big. So you do not need actually to a beam from from you know this magic baseline anymore really to address this issue at least. And uh, so I should be politically correct because you know, uh, we still are working on the factory for other reasons. So so that is how it is. And for example, that is why to see this uh, Nova is not sensitive, but uh, Dune is going to be sensitive. Okay, so often we are not very sensitive, but if you are lucky, 
uh, then and, and the, if it happened that the theta one three theta two three is uh, something like 0.4 or 0.6 and not at 0.5, then we will be able to discriminate uh, or you will be able to find out the the the, the value uh, that that is the non maximum uh, from from our data at all. So this is actually shown how it will be separated theta two three uh, if it is 0.4 and if it is 0.6 or so on, so how will we doing this one? Okay, this is actually, this is, this, is, this, this is not very important because we will know for theta 2, 3 and, sorry, at least the delta f square 2, 3, a much better precision soon. Okay, so now coming back to the, uh, the, the, the uh, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be discussing how we, are, how we are making progress with the project itself. So as I told you, the one of the thing is the RPC construction. RPC is a, looks a simple detector, but very difficult to operate in a stable condition. It's simple because it has just two, you know, uh, bakelite or glass plates separated by a gap of two millimeter or so. And then you put the outer layer of this glass or bakelite with a, with a graphite coating uh, so that you can apply the electric field. And then you apply a very high electric field of something like 10 kilovolt within that uh, two millimeter gap. And then uh, the charged particles will go through that and apply high voltage. So it will ionize, and the electron um, cloud will avalanche, will be producing the high field, and they will be picked up uh, by by this capacitive coupling by the strips, uh, what you call the pickup strips on the on the on the two sides of the of the of the uh, of the two outer side uh, side of the glass plates, and then they if, if you put your strips in the in the orthogonal direction, you will get both x and y information from the same RPC. So you. Can, why you need two glasses, why you want no, you have to make a gas gap. Yeah, in principle, you can make one of them conducting. Yeah. Okay, you can do that one. Yeah. But then you will get only one side information because here we have want to get the information from both sides. So you, you have your pickup strips are here as well as here. Okay. So yes, okay. So, I, so it is actually uh, you know the what they use in the current refrigerator gas is. 134A, R134A, and uh, I think C2H2F4 is this, uh, this is the gas. That is 95% and 5% uh, isobutane. Okay. However, uh, to control the, uh, the streamer pulses, we have tried this one and we found a very small fraction, something like 0.1 to 0.2% of SF6 will control the you know, uh, streamer. Uh, to a reasonable value so that we don't get even streamer pulses, all the pulses even with the electrical. The C24, whatever is it? The yes, uh, that was, is, uh, that, is, that is actually, uh, at the moment is uh, green gas, what they call, but it may be replaced around 2024, 25. Okay, so when we have, so now at the moment, all the RPC, here as well as, I mean, we are proposing or what they use at CERN, for the CMS and Atlas is the same gas mixture. Well, it's but, a big problem there, yeah. everybody is. Yes. However, however, uh, unlike the CERN system where they are releasing the gas, it will be a completely open gas. I mean, a recirculation system. So I'll come to that. One, that we are we are trying to make a recirculation system, so we do not release the gas at all, but we repurify it and then use it. Of course, I mean, if there is a new gas is coming up, we are you know, because you know, we'll, be, we'll be using that. But at the moment, so this is how it is uh, set up. Now, so we actually, when we started this project, we didn't know nothing about these RPCs and how they operate. So we started with a, and this is a huge job for us. So we started with a, this, my colleague is holding the first RPCs we made, is here, is 10 centimeter by 30 centimeter size, and then from there we start making 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter. When we have understood how it operates, move to a meter by meter RPCs, and then finally, in the back of that one is not a blackboard, but this is the final two meter by two meter RPC gap, gas gap that uh, we have developed. So this is actually process of development and uh, it took us a lot of time, almost four or five years to master the technology and then, and then putting it up. So these two things is there, important. Is one is the efficiency of the RPCs, which is more than 90% efficient. And this is the time resolution. Uh, this is actually the time resolution you get from a, from a plastic scintillator here that we have shown. And this is actually the resolution that we got with our RPC that we built actually. So you can see that we can get this one nanosecond 
one nanosecond type of resolution that we need uh, using this RPC. So that is our goal. And, uh, and of course, if we use this RPC in a different mode, multi-gap, you can go up to something like 100 picosecond resolution, but you don't need that uh, kind of resolution. So with that, we are quite happy with their performance. And then our question is just to build bigger and bigger RPC. So first we make up, this is in our lab. So we're handling this, this gap glass is simple, you know, the float glass of two, yeah, two to three millimeter thick and two meter by two meter. It's very fragile and to handle. So, so and these are the, so you, you put them uh, two gap is basically by these buttons uh, in the middle and in some grid of 20 centimeter grid. And then put the top glass plates on top of that. And then at the edge of this one, you put this uh, kind of spacious uh, also. And then you put a gas inlet, gas outlet and make the gas gap. Once you have the gas gap, then you put the pickup strip on the top and bottom, apply high voltage, and so on. Those are simple uh, methods. So once we have built this uh, RPCs in our lab, then we moved on making a stack of those RPCs. This is a two meter by two meter stack of RPCs, just testing them of their general performance and so on. And, uh, and so, so we moved to making this uh, stack. This is a one meter by one meter RPC stack. And then it was monitoring cosmic ray muons continuous. And this is actually our almost test bench. And then we can see nice pulses coming from the from the from the cosmic ray muon. And then we can get the time distribution, time resolution, the charge spectrum. Though we are not using the charge spectrum at the moment, we are using at a heat information at the moment. But in principle, because we are running in the avalanche mode, we can get the charge information from the RPC. So that's because it is all the Yes. 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 So now then finally last year uh, we built up this full 2 meter by 2 meter RPC stack and uh, this is also working very nicely operation over the time and then using that then whatever. Huh? So you can start looking into the cosmic ray muon track actually continuously. So you put it in your, in your lab and then you start monitoring the cosmic ray muon. So continuously they are monitoring and uh, every day we collected the millions of those muons. Uh, now and then these are used for finding out the tracking capabilities of the RPC system and various other things. For example, you, even you can do some physics actually. This is the angular distribution of muons, uh, atmospheric muons, uh, using this uh, setup actually that uh, we have done there. And now this is that this so the imaging imaging capabilities of the RPCs. So what you are showing is the white yellow spot are the places where you have the buttons. And so those are the dead space in the detector. So these are the muons. When they're tracking through your detector, you just you just fit a track and then see where it hits the detector, and then uh, and can, you can see that uh, whenever your inefficiencies are there around the buttons, and this is the the slope timing slope. So this is positive means it is downward going muon, and negative means upward going muon. Of course, all our muons are downward going; they are atmospheric muon. So this is shows the you know using the timing information, and we can uh, find out the directionality of the muon because. Also so this actually, this has given us complete confidence that uh, this detector system will do the type of physics that we want to do uh, in our experiment. And of course, this is what I was talking about. The you know, these are all developed indigenously and uh, in our in, in our in our institute using the local help from the local industry. And in India, actually, it is very difficult to get because people do not industry doesn't want to go into this kind of thing because they don't know what is there. And they don't want to invest. They want to, they want they want to just. You know, sell their sell their project, and so it is very difficult to convince someone that come and join with us and do some R&D. But this guy, he was an ex um, uh, TIFR engineer who has started this company, so he has still some you know thing for uh, doing research. So he joined us, and we have developed this uh, recirculation system where we, we, we just uh, recirculate the gas and then go through this uh, you know purified to the molecular sieves and the uh, radical you using uh, you know copper basically. And then again, put back, and uh, so this is operational and uh, working quite well. Only thing is that uh, it is now very small scale, so we have to make a large, bigger, uh, you know, system uh, to make this work. How much does it cost? Ah, this is actually not yet known. So he also, I have asked him the, uh, the question that he is also not clear. So he is uh, said that, uh, but I would say it will be in about uh, I mean, the whole thing will be in a couple of million. Yeah. So now, now our next step was there. 
So how do I induce? We have to. I told you that these RPCs are too big, or two meter by two meter, and they have to meet thirty thousand of them. We cannot certainly can build in any, any laboratory or any university. So we have to go to industry, no question. And industries are not ready. So we ourselves went to the industry and asked them to develop the you know tools so that we can automatize the whole production process. And that's why is that this is the automatized method that we developed with the industry in collaboration with the industry. We paid for everything, but they developed it for us. And now with this one, then we have gone to Sangovian. This is a glass making factory um, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the world. And they have their factories in Chennai and other places. So we went to them and they make the float glass. And they were interested in also participating in some kind of RMD with us. And because this is a big project for the for the for the India, so they thought you know this may give them some good you know, name. So they have joined us, and they are now producing these RPCs uh, completely you know automatized way. And uh, and we have given a pilot production of 400 RPCs for them. They're uh, they're actually already supplied something like 80 of them, and then we'll soon complete the supply. And then we can give them the whole order. Uh, and, uh, so this is this is this is going on quite well actually. Actually, now coming back to the magnet. So this is actually you can see this is the coil. Okay, so this this these are these plates will be slotted here, and then the this is the copper coil, the hollow copper coil, which is going around this uh, whole detector from here to here, and then in the loop. And uh, this is where they will magnetize the iron plates. So if you take the one iron layer, okay, here 16 meter by 16 meter, the field configuration will be something like this. So this is where is the coil is going. And uh, so it, the field changes here in the opposite direction, uh, in the outer side and the inner side. So the mapping of the field is very important for our tracking system. And, uh, so this, so this, this is simulated, and this is actually now uh, being. We have developed a prototype and checked this. Uh, the field is coming and uh, correctly. So we are now making this uh, much bigger prototype that I will come to. More, so I, I thought I have a picture here, but I have a later for. Okay. So this is the magnetic field configuration that uh, we will be using there. So now about the DAQ framework, so collecting the data. So each of the 30,000 RPCs will be completely independent in it, you know, so that we can, from the back end, we can address to that RPC and look into it help uh, through, you know, through TCP IP protocol, using TCP IP protocol, and the whole thing. That's why the RPC 1 to RPC 30,000 is basically, each of them has their own front end, that is amplifier and discriminator, that is next to the strip in the x as well as y direction, and then each of them will have 128 channel of uh, signal coming, and they will be processed in a FPGA at the corner of each RPC. So each RPC, all the heat information will be cornered, the monitoring, except everything will be done, and these, these each of these FPGA will be then connected to the back end uh, through a switching system and using the TCP IP protocol. So that is the that is the DAQ system, and. Uh, so we'll be working on, and then so this is to some extent shown here. So this is actually let us say the glass RPC, and here will be one pickup. Uh, this uh, front end amplifiers and discriminator uh, is, is actually complete acid based uh, design, and each of these amplifiers will take care of eight strips. So there will be eight such acid in this area and acid this area, and the and the after discrimination. The, all the pulses will be sent to this corner where there will be FPG will be sitting and they will be processing the pulses, they will be producing the pre trigger, as well as all the monitoring performance that has to be done will be done by this uh, FPG here, card here. And then they will be connected to the back end uh, through switches. And there are other you know, lines here like the gas connections, etc., for all the RPCs will be handled here. Is there any issues with that control? Uh, no, no, no. These are no, so there are no, yeah, 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 yeah. There are simple ones. There are no, there are no there are control. Is your DAC more expensive than the detectors? Uh, no, not really. That is not, uh, no, no, not much expensive. Actually, our main cost is the cost of the item. I see. Detector cost, the cost of the item. So we have, we have also told the government that any item will be there. After the experiment, you can take it back, like the Canadians have done for the snow experiment. Right? So, Heavy water was given to them on loan, and so, so but anyway, the government is kind enough that okay, they have. You know, and so, for the trigger, you trigger one. Yeah. So, how do you trigger? I'll come to that one. Just a little later. 
So this is how each handle, so there is a pre-trigger is also generated in this uh, PGA. Pre-trigger means whether there is a one hit or two hit or three hit successive, you know, strips hits, and this, there is a kind of, you know, pre-trigger we generate here. You use those in a later, you know, trigger setup where we make some kind of local decision whether this is a, you know, a local uh, hits are there or not a little later. So this FPGA, for example, it does many things that I told you here. So it takes the, also the TDC, the timing information is also um, uh, collected here. So at the moment we are using HP TDC, this is developed in CERN, but we are just now developing our own TDC as it also. So this is, uh, so it will do this uh, timing information, it will get this, uh, all this uh, 128 uh, LVDS outputs uh, that is coming from this individual strip information. It will also do the monitoring of the temperature, pressure, and humidity in that area because our pieces are little sensitive to humidity. It will do the pre-trigger generation, and then it will connect to this PCP IP protocol here. Okay. At the moment, we are using WizNet chip, but we plan to use the optical you know, you know, connection uh, in the in the next version of this uh, in the, of this setup. So this is uh, the, this whole thing. Okay. Now about trigger, we are talking about. So now it is a uh, so neutrino event will be localized in somewhere inside the big detector, and it will be localized event. So you will have a, you will have democracy entire you know all detector that every part of the detector should be taken and recorded. So what I have done, we have divided the whole detector into a overlapping sectors, okay, certain uh, combining certain layer, and each of these overlapping sectors, and uh, this is we call so this is the we have this is the module. So module is divided into these overlapping segments. And then each segment has some number of RPCs. Okay, so we generate within the RPCs our pre-trigger. So it is either the each RPC is giving one signal, zero signal, or two, three RPCs, whatever is the count that we can this one. And then how many such RPCs are hit in this locality in the local environment? And this is combined together, we make a trigger decision. Whether whether out of this, uh, let us say here are twelve layers involved, and out of that twelve layers maybe five has given us hit, singly, or four of them have given up multiple hits. And so that kind of logic we develop, and that is how the trigger is generated. So this was also generated in a FPGA environment. So these are all FPGA program. So all the pre-trigger from the individual RPCs goes to a separate uh, unit, where these FPGAs are the, you know, designed for the tr trigger logic, and they will decide whether the trigger is you know, there or not. And then it will transmit back to the RPCs, where the, where the pulses will be latched and they will be transferred to the backend, and then that is how the whole system will work. So, so why do you need a trigger? It's because of the noise? Why do you need a trigger? Good question. So in pin trigger, we are thinking of that one, whether we can make a triggerless system and just collect everything in the backend. So that is going on. We are not so confident so that we are will be ready for that one, but yes, you are absolutely right. So we are looking into that option also, having a triggerless system. But at the moment, we want to trigger, so that is, we are more confident in that. Yes. So now, so this is the, so this is the, the trigger scheme of this one RPC. Now, okay, now where are the people? You know, in India, you may have the big population, but you don't have really a, a good number of experimental high energy physicists in the country. So we try to address that question. So we thought, okay, let's train them. So we have started, when we have the project, about 2008, a graduate school called IMO Graduate Training Program, IMO Graduate School, which is actually surrogating inside our own institute, TIFR, Tata Institute, where basically we train the student for one year, mostly on the you know uh, on on their classroom lectures on detectors and, uh, and neutrino physics and so on. But then after that, they are put into this uh, all the development that I talked about. Uh, some of them work on those uh, development work, and many of the this trigger system have been designed for, for example, one student. And some of them also are those that are associated with this, our team uh, in the universities and other places who are doing the simulation work and then working with them. And, so, and, and we are at the eighth year actually, eighth batch of students right now is uh, in, in, in doing PhD. And uh, if we get the project back, you know, we hope that some of them will, will join us back and uh, making the workforce that is needed uh, to implement a project of this magnitude. So this is uh, also a very successful story that we have started. So now, to give you a current status, uh, the financial approval of the government was even uh, obtained in December 2014 for uh, 1,583 crore. This is roughly around 240 million dollar equivalent. 
However, this is this is actually the final. We, we can add it uh, once it is given the money. You can just go and do the project, and that's what we are about to do uh, in uh, in the beginning of 2015. But that's why the the, the activists and the politicians have gone and go to the court and then ask for stay order. So we are right now awaiting. So so we have to get the this local government. The local government is not giving us money, but we are going to their with their state. So they have to give us certain permission. So they have to give us permission to construct that institute at Madurai. They also have to give us the permission for the pollution control board clearance that is absolutely necessary now. And however, so as a result, all our contract, tunnel, cavern, infrastructure that we have started already are on hold and uh, we have not been able to proceed. The detector design, everything is finalized, but here we don't have any problem. So this we are going in full force. So we have made everything and the RPCs are being built. And the, we have already procured all the uh, steel copper plates that is required, so I'll come to that. The full-size RPCs have been fabricated and characterization done. 400 glass RPCs have been ordered with the Sengobian, and delivery has begun. The square bear stack that we already saw is uh, working. And now the 600 strand of low carbon steel, and we have HC copper conductor spool, this is for the coil, for the magnet, uh, is already been at we have procured those, and since we have no place, we have just stored them at Kalpakkam in a facility in Chennai, and just waiting for our clearance. And uh, all the artists have been totally ready. The electronic DAQ trigger for this frontier engineering model is in the final stage of production, so these are all there. The simulation software is already developed. I have shown you the physics, and then the physics white paper is uh, already been there in the web for almost a year, and it will be published soon. And uh, this is the uh, reference to that one. And we are now the eight bed of higher value student that is doing the project. So, so apart from this, you uh, know, but it's happened, and uh, we have a democratic country, and uh, it's very difficult to go out of this. And uh, it, we have done a, a reasonable amount of uh, outreach activities in the local area, and the local people are fully convinced with us. However, our problem is that the politicians are also local. And he can put and his people and spread all the rumors 24 hours a day. And we don't have that much strength, uh, you know, uh, for there to go there and then convince again and again to the villagers. So at the moment, villagers in two minds. So when I go and talk to them, and uh, so they say that, I, well, I mean, we, you probably were telling right, but we don't understand what you are talking. So you, we better be safe. So you know, don't come here. That is the attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this attitude may change once we get the, the pollution control board clearance, and that's what we are waiting for this one. If it doesn't happen, and it's really actually the project has been you know, there in this condition for quite long, actually. and uh, if it gets delayed too long, then there is no purpose of doing this project. So how long can you wait before you spend 200 dollars in your So, no, no, we can't spend. We can't spend. We are not paying anything. We are not spending any money there. It's just there. Our salaries come from the so salaries are not part of No, no. No, but we have a recruitment of 140 people for the project, including 40 scientists, about 50 engineers, and the technicians. That is also approved, but that on hold also. We cannot yes, recruit anyone. Separate that is called that center that we are building, and they will be posted, located there. Like 10 tons where they see copper is coming from. So these are, I told you that we had a pre-project approval. Yeah, so this is from that funding. So that you have a plan B? Yes, okay. So plan B is, uh, we are tired actually, you know. Uh, so we had, this is not our first place. We had to another place, and we have been asked to get out of that place because uh, it was the elephant corridor, that's what the activist declared. However, while they said the elephant corridor, there is a highway running, and, uh, and uh, there is no, but See, actually, this is very difficult, and uh, there are lots of uh, issues. You know, the, some of these uh, activists, they they are living is to oppose projects, and some of them do extremely good work. And, and I'm, I know, I'm, and so, <laughs> so we moved from one place to second place. Of this is second place, and uh, so second place. So we, if we move from here, we don't have too many places to go. We don't want to go to the Himalayas because the rock there is not that strong, you know. And also it is earthquake prone, as you know, in that part. We have gone to this side because the Deccan Plateau, the rocks are much older, volcanic rock, than the Himalayan rock. So 
very strong. This is like a monolithic rock, very strong. You can do that. And it is also not earthquake prone. So that is the reason we have gone. So we don't have too many places. So the plan B is actually just before I came to this country for four months, we have gone and visited that the mine, and, uh, not the Kolar gold field, but there is a mine uh, called, uh, but this is actually uranium mine. But this uranium, they have already extracted. Because I, I, we don't have too much uranium in India. And so this mine belonged to the Department of Ethnic Energy. And they told us, OK, we are you know, abandoning that place. You may go and think of possibly looking into that site. So there is a mine in, uh, in the eastern part, in uh, Jadugura, called. It's uh, some 150 kilometers or, uh, or maybe 200 um, kilometers from Calcutta. So we may go, uh, uh, we are looking into the option of relocating this in the mine. But that can be a really big job because we don't like mine. Uh, taking those 50 kiloton islands inside the mine to a sap will be a good job. So the physics part of view, the depth doesn't matter? That is 900 meter compared to the one kilometer. Because, I mean, in the US, where they were thinking about home state, the deeper side, there is really no reason to make it very deep. Uh, yeah, no, so, so uh, that's what I'm saying, 900 meters is good enough for us. That is not the issue. There is the issue of taking material down. Logistics is the issue. But we may not have any option. And uh, if you want to do this project, probably we have to go there. Unless we get, so we have given last ditch effort that we wait for another couple of months. And if nothing happens here, either we decide or. Depth you are talking? Oh, Minas is five kilograms. Five kilograms. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is This is okay. This you can you can see. Minas is a mini hour detector. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It is a magnetized detector. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where is the transform? Yeah. In fact, we are talking to some of the magnet experts on. Okay, so that is the current status, and thank you. So far, so and uh, we are in, uh, in uh, I mean, collaboration. See, we don't have any high energy physics facilities in the country, so right now we are only collaborating. We are collaborating with the, I mean, in the accelerator field mostly, in CMS, in Bell, uh, we have the uh, collaboration. We have also the university groups are collaborating in the neutrino program at Fermilab, uh, in Nova, uh, and also there are interest in the Dune. Uh, so we, we, we do collaborate. And, uh, and I thought that, uh, see, we want to build up a group. And uh, so we all don't know. I and mean, we continue to collaborate with the outside world, certainly. And we are also looking for international collaboration. But we are not going at the moment and telling them, OK, come and join for this project. Because simply, we are not sure what is happening. I mean, three years back, I was more confident than today, uh, looking at the, you know, the pace way it is going. But I'm just curious. So the export control must be an issue, right? Because uh, you that uh, India is just so, so no, I don't think actually this is the, we have we have gone far away from those uh, days. Uh, this was in uh, ninety. Now it is much more. Uh, well, still the control, and still. and then uh, we don't need actually much of this, uh, you know, which is under uh, export control. Uh, the uh, items because if you see here, there is no big issue of the of the, the type of uh, uh, we only need from outside is is the PGA chips. Uh, if you see this one, rest all of us are they're, they're developing. So there is no issue. Did you say in terms of atmospheric neutrino energies, what's the sort of range in which? So if you look studying? into the atmospheric neutrino, uh, so we are sensitive something from 700 MeV to 20 GeV is our range. And uh, the the matter effect or the resonance is, uh, is, is more uh, is around uh, 2 GeV to 5 GeV, and uh, over a length of, I think, it's roughly around, picked around 6,000 kilometers or so. So that is the region. Okay, but 700 is probably the most. Yeah. This is, this is, the, this is the high dialectic material medium, just basically. This is some kind of plastic, I, exactly. Plastic. Uh, I, I, know. I, I can give you the composition. Uh, 
question was, I think the speaker 